All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us and welcome to Anderson House. My name is Andrew Allen and I'm the Historical Programs Manager for the American Revolution Institute of the Society of the Cincinnati. The American Revolution Institute promotes knowledge and appreciation for the achievement of American independence, fulfilling the aim of the Continental Army officers and their French counterparts who founded the Society of the Cincinnati in 1783 to perpetuate the memory and legacy of the American Revolution. In addition to tonight's author's talk, the Institute fulfills that aim by supporting advanced study, developing exhibitions and other historical programs and tours, advocating historic preservation, and providing resources to classrooms nationwide that benefit teachers, students, and scholars alike. Tonight's author's talk, a program that is made possible in part from a generous gift from the Massachusetts Society of the Cincinnati, fe features Dr. Brooke Barbier discussing her new book, King Hancock, the Radical Influence of a Moderate Founding Father, recently published by the University of Harvard Press. Brooke Barbier is a public historian who holds a PhD in American history from Boston College. In addition to King Hancock, she is the author of Boston in the American Revolution, A Town Versus an Empire, published by the, Uni the, excuse me, the History Press in 2017, uh, which focuses on pre-revolutionary Boston and its significance during the American Revolution. In addition to her scholarship, she is also the founder of Ye Old Tavern Tours, a popular guided outing along Boston's renowned Freedom Trail, and that was founded in 2013. Uh, no, but before I hand things over to uh, Dr. Barbier, however, the usual housekeeping items are in order for our friends tuning in with us on Zoom this evening. Following tonight's author's talk, there will be a question and answer session, so please feel free to submit your questions at any point during the presentation by using the Q&A function that can be found at the bottom of your screen, and we will do our best to incorporate them with our live audience questions. Should you have any technical related questions or comments, those can be submitted by using the chat function, and one of our staff members will do their best to assist you as they will be monitoring that throughout the talk. Uh, so with all of that, and without further delay, please join me in welcoming to Anderson House, Dr. Brooke Barbier. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you guys for coming tonight. I'm so excited to speak with you. We're gonna talk about how John Hancock moderated a revolution. John Hancock is famous for his audacious signature on the Declaration of Independence. Here it is. But would it surprise you to know that his politics were much less bold? I'm going to talk tonight about how a man with middle of the road and often shifting political views came to be one of our country's founders. Hancock was a moderate in a time and place of radicals. His adopted hometown of Boston was the epicenter of mobbing, tarring and feathering, and violent protest in the 1760s and 70s. Yet Hancock was able to avoid such extremes, remaining popular with the masses and affecting political change in spite of being slow to adopt many resistance efforts. We'll discuss how Hancock's moderation affected two parts of the American Revolution. First, the resistance and rebellion of the 1760s and 70s, and then in the new nation. Let's get a brief background on John Hancock. When he was seven, his life fundamentally changed. His father died and he went to live with his wealthy paternal uncle, Uncle Thomas, who lived in Boston. Thomas was a self-made man who in his lifetime amassed one of the largest fortunes in Massachusetts by opening a merchant house called the House of Hancock. John Hancock's life fundamentally changes again when Uncle Thomas and John uh, Uncle Thomas dies, and John goes on to inherit all of his uncle's mercantile business holdings. Overnight then, he becomes one of the most prominent men in Boston. His uncle's death coincided with a big change for the colonies. Uncle Thomas died in 1764. Just the year earlier, the French and Indian War had ended. And this is when, 1764 is when Parliament begins passing taxes, and we begin to get that a feeling of no taxation without representation among colonists. In 1765, Parliament, Britain's governing body, 
passes the Stamp Act, a tax on printed goods. Boston despises the Stamp Act, and they target two royal officials to express their displeasure, Andrew Oliver and Thomas Hutchinson. Both of Crown officials had their property destroyed in Stamp Act riots in 1765 in Boston. Andrew Oliver was the Stamp Act collector of Massachusetts, so the riot against him made sense to Hancock. It followed 18th century practices of mobbing. You're upset about the Stamp Act, so you target the Stamp Act collector. This made sense. The mob against Hutchinson, however, when his home was utterly ransacked, Hancock opposed. This attack seemed personal and not political. Hancock wants to get the men who participated in these riots together and try to convince them to act respectably. He was worried particularly that there would be more violence on the day that the Stamp Act was to go into effect. So, He's also worried that he's a wealthy man, as Andrew Oliver and Thomas Hutchinson were. So if the mob decided to turn against another wealthy man, it could be Hancock next. He decides to bring these men together and try to convince them to act respectably. He and another merchant host a party at a local tavern that was familiar to Hancock and popular with artisans. Colonial taverns were places where men debated politics, gathered for camaraderie, and built connection. There was no shortage of watering holes in the hard-drinking colonial town of Boston. There's still no shortage of uh, watering holes in the hard-drinking town of current-day Boston. Elites didn't usually find themselves in the same taverns as men from the lower orders, but that wasn't a trouble a problem for Hancock. He loved to entertain and host, and he chose to entertain at a tavern familiar to him and popular with artisans. The Green Dragon Tavern had been around for a century and was a large brick building. The upstairs, beginning in the 1760s, was home to a Masonic lodge that John Hancock belonged to, as well as silversmith Paul Revere and Dr. Joseph Warren. The name of the tavern derives from this guy here. You can kind of see the dragon poking out. I've got a close up here. It was made of copper. It oxidized in the salt air, turned green, and it became the Green Dragon Tavern. That night at the Green Dragon, Hancock was a generous host as he would be throughout his life. He paid a large sum of money for food and drinks, and at one point gave a speech convincing everyone there to try and demonstrate peacefully going forward. Hancock's plan worked. On the day the Stamp Act was to go into effect, there was a much more fe festive atmosphere in Boston. Ultimately, the Stamp Act was repealed shortly after, and so Hancock doesn't even need to worry further about the Stamp Act. He goes back to resuming business with the British Empire. One errant tax, like the Stamp Act, didn't cause him to want to stop doing business the way he and his family had for decades. Riots factored again, factored in again, excuse me, three years later when another tax is passed and he resists, Hancock resists paying all of his taxes. The tax was on imported uh, British goods and it was called the Townshend Duties. Hancock doesn't wanna pay taxes on one of his favorite drinks, Madeira. Madeira is a fortified wine from an island of the same name. It's off the coast of Africa. It was under Portuguese control and it was a favorite of Hancock. He was exacting when ordering it. Listen to what he said. I don't stand at any price. Let it be good, I like a rich wine. This is a man accustomed to getting what he wants. This love of Madeira leads to one of, one of the most memorable mobs of the American Revolution. So the Stamp Act is repealed in 1766, but the Townshend duties are passed a year later. If the tax was bad, this new customs board established in Boston was worse. Parliament did learn something about the Stamp Act, 
in that they knew they needed to reinforce collection of taxes in Boston. So they set up new, a new customs board there. The customs officials were loathsome. They earnestly patrolled the harbor, eager to stop and search any vessel that they thought might be smuggling. They also had hate, hated Bostonians for what they believed to be their permissive attitude towards smuggling. They were determined to catch somebody, and there's no bigger target or bigger fish to catch than the wealthy and popular John Hancock. So that's who they go after. Now, Hancock's lucky with the Townshend duties because here his economic interests align with the radical political interests. Radicals don't want to pay the tax because they don't want another tax. Hancock doesn't want to pay the tax because it's going to affect the price of the goods he's importing from England. Hancock, though, has an easy way around the tax, and it's what he and his uncle had been doing for years, smuggling. In the summer of 1768, one of Hancock's ships called Liberty docks at Hancock's Wharf. Let's look at this map for a second. It's a map of Boston in 1769. And while I wouldn't recommend it, you could still use this map in downtown Boston today. There are many of the same landmarks and some of the same street names. Uh, you see the arrow pointing to Hancock's mansion, uh, Han Hancock's Wharf, excuse me. There was also Long Wharf, the longest wharf here. Not every merchant was wealthy enough to have their own wharf named for them, but Hancock certainly was, and you can tell it's one of the bigger wharfs. So Hancock's ship called Liberty docks at Hancock's Wharf in 1768. He declares that there is 25 casks of Madeira on board, and the customs official named Thomas Kirk accepts this number Hancock pays his taxes on it, and they both go their separate ways. Except Liberty's cargo could hold more than double that. And it was unlikely that Hancock would sail across the Atlantic with his ship at half capacity. He's much too experienced to do that, and customs commissioners were suspicious. They asked Thomas Kirk about the incident, and he confirmed that everything had been on the level. Customs commissioners were sure Hancock was smuggling though, and they had a stroke of good luck just a month later. Here's what happens. Thomas Kirk comes forward and changes his story. He says that when he had said everything that had been on the level, he was afraid. Captain John Marshall, the captain of Liberty, was the one who was intimidating Thomas Kirk. But John Marshall, the captain, had recently died. And so Kirk said, now I'm comfortable coming forward to tell the true account of what happened. And he spins quite a tale. He says that when Liberty docked, Captain John Marshall asked Kirk to look the other way as they illegally unloaded goods. So flat out, he's claiming that a captain is asking a customs commissioner to, com to permit him to smuggle. This is not believable. But Kirk says that when he refused, Marshall and five or six men grabbed Kirk, pulled him below deck, locked him into a cabin, and nailed the top down. For three hours, they could hear the hoisting out of goods and the noise of the tackle above. Kirk says then it went silent. The door opens to the cabin, and John Marshall fills the doorway. He says that if he breathes, that if Kirk breathes a word about what he saw or heard that night, he and his property would be harmed. This story is the work of an imaginative mind, but it does what it needed. It implicates Hancock. So customs commissioners go down to Hancock's wharf. I've got another view for you. This one comes to us from Paul Revere. It's of 1768. It's the depiction of British troops arriving to Boston, but once again, you can see Hancock's wharf jutting out prominently into the harbor. So these customs commissioners, now with Kirk's revised story in hand, decide to head down to the wharf. Little else but a hint of wrongdoing by a customs commissioner would gather a crowd in Boston at this time, but especially in defense of John Hancock, one of the town's most popular men. 
So a crowd is gathering around and telling those customs commissioners that they shall not seize liberty unless they want to be chucked into the harbor. The customs commissioners are determined. They seize liberty. They brand liberty's mast with the king's mark. And then they haul liberty over to Romney, a British warship, and secure it to the ship in Boston Harbor. The townspeople erupt. They throw rocks at the customs commissioners. They hit them with clubs and brick bats. The son of one of the customs commissioners who hadn't even been involved in the seizure of Liberty was also overrun. The mob dragged him by the hair through the streets while throwing dirt on him and hitting him with sticks. All of that is a lot, but then they take it one step further. The mob now numbers between 500 and 1,000 men. And according to the royal governor, they were filled with rum. This crowd then drags the sailboat built by one of these customs commissioners that had seized liberty. They haul it out of Boston Harbor, through the streets of Boston, up to Boston Common, the public park, where they set the boat on fire. This was a stunning display to defend Hancock's right to smuggle wine. The thing is, Hancock's not nearly as troubled by the politics of it all. Despite this violent mob in protest of John Hancock, by the way, if we look, if you've been to Boston, Boston Common is still the public park today, um, and Hancock's mansion sits at the top, sat at the top of Boston Common. Hancock's top concern is making profits, not opposing taxes. As long as British officials held on to liberty, he could not use it and he couldn't make any money. So he wanted to cut a deal with the British. His politics were not radical enough to stop trading with London forever. He was a businessman and employed hundreds of local men and he wants to get back to work, just like he did after the Stamp Act. Dr. Joseph Warren acts as his go-between. Joseph Warren was a man popular with rebels in Boston, but also popular with crown officials. So he's the perfect go-between. And he brokers the deal, which is pretty simple. If Hancock gets his ship back so that he can begin trading, Hancock will agree to stand trial if they want to charge him with smuggling. The deal is in place. Everything is set. Then Hancock that night starts to get knocks on his door as, as visitors arrive. Hancock's mansion, you saw, sat at the top of Boston Common. Here's an image of it. Soon, one observer said Hancock's house, quote, was full. Radical firebrands, Samuel Adams and James Otis, went to Hancock's mansion and told him he could not make this deal. It's a bad deal. As other Sons of Liberty filled in and tried to convince Hancock of the same thing, Hancock eventually, with mounting pressure, reneges on the deal. He's going to have to protest the way that Samuel Adams and James Otis want for now. They have more radical ideas, but it's safer at this time to go along with them. Shortly after the Liberty Riot, British troops are sent to occupy Boston. That's that image we saw from Paul Revere of uh, the troops' arrival. In March 1770, they shot into a rowdy crowd and killed five men in what we know today as the Boston Massacre. The Boston Massacre does not activate Hancock the way you might think. He retreats from politics rather than going all in. After the Boston Massacre, most of the township duties are lifted, the troops depart town, and Hancock wants to focus on almost anything other than politics. He starts looking for a wife, he restarts his business, he's taking vacations. Hancock stepping away from politics was noticed by others. You're gonna recognize this name. Thomas Hutchinson, the same guy who had his house destroyed in the Stamp Act riots of 1765, He's now royal governor of Massachusetts, and he notices that Hancock has stepped away. He says, there was a breach among the patriots in Massachusetts Bay. 
Hancock had, quote, been firmly attached to Mr. Adams, end quote. But then in 1771, suddenly to Hutchinson's delight, all friendship between them was suddenly at an end. And Mr. Hancock expressed his dissatisfaction with the party. Word reached London too. That's how important Hancock and Samuel Adams were at this time. Secretary of State Lord Hillsborough wrote to Hutchinson, informing him that Hancock had, quote, deserted the cause of liberty. Hillsborough urged Governor Hutchinson to capitalize on this rupture and try to get Hancock on his side. Hutchinson had previously tried to sway other rebels into the crown's fold. He'd solicited John Adams, who turned him down. He tried with Dr. Benjamin Church and was ultimately successful. Church began by anonymously publishing newspaper articles against the Sons of Liberty, even as he remained a Son of Liberty. Church would eventually sell himself completely out and receive payment for secrets about rebel forces paying General Thomas Gage of the British Army. Hutchinson struck out with John Adams. He struck out with Hancock too. Han uh, uh, Hutchinson said of Hancock that he intended to quit all active concern in public affairs and to attend to his private business. He even swore, Hancock did, that he will, quote, never again connect himself with Adams. Now, Samuel Adams doesn't need Hancock to stay politically active. He can do that all on his own. At this time in 1772, he sets up a committee of correspondence to communicate with the other colonies outside of Massachusetts about the Crown's infringements and violations. The Boston Committee of Correspondence included merchants, doctors, and lawyers. Many of them went to Harvard and many of them were Masons. Hancock checks these boxes, but he declines to sit on the committee. Thomas Cushing, Hancock's friend, also a merchant and a fellow moderate, also does not sit on the committee. Samuel Adams blames Hancock and Cushing for not being a part of the committee, not its ideas or the committee itself. Privately, however, John and Samuel Adams were concerned both merchants had not signed on. Samuel Adams loathed their tepid politics. Get ready for this one. He said, for the sake of their own ease or their own safety, they preach the people into paltry ideas of moderation. Samuel Adams claimed that Cushing and Hancock did not, quote, realize the evil tendency of their conduct, end quote, by declining to be a part of the Committee of Correspondence. Avoid being ensnared by the trap set by Samuel Adams, that of a false binary. Hancock either joined the Committee of Correspondence or his conduct was evil. Rarely is life, much less revolution, that clean. Hancock and Cushing, certainly didn't want their businesses to suffer with new taxes, but they also weren't as agitated as others about Crown policies, especially when the troops had been sent out of town and most of the Townshend duties had been lifted. People are complex and make political decisions for myriad reasons. What may be good for them one year is not gonna be good for them the next. Adams then would have been surprised a year later when Hancock is back in. He supports the destruction of the tea in 1773, what we know today as the Boston Tea Party. By the way, the 250th anniversary of the Boston Tea Party is coming up this December 16th. Hancock gave a speech moments before the crowd went down to the harbor to destroy the tea. Hancock's support for the Boston Tea Party is what gives my, book my book's title its name. My book is titled King Hancock, and it, that name first appears in 1774 in the historical record. British troops reoccupied Boston after the destruction of the tea, and they were trying to find out who had organized this event. They held captive a Bostonian named Samuel Dyer, and they, they demanded to know who ordered the destruction of the tea. 
Dyer said, nobody. The British officers yelled in his face, you're a damned liar. It was King Hancock and the damned Sons of Liberty. This is the first time we see the nickname in record and it's so clever. It captures Hancock's popularity as a town leader in Boston, but it also has the backhanded effect of serving as a condemnation of the colonists, that the best they could do, the best their king was, was this guy, John Hancock. Then something extraordinary happens. The colonists use the nickname as their own. This happens on April 19th, 1775, the day the Revolutionary War begins with battles in Lexington and Concord, Massachusetts. Things had gone badly for the British Army in Concord that afternoon, and they decide to retreat 20 miles back to Boston. This is a brutal retreat back. They are being fired on nearly the entire way home. Worse, they can't see who's firing on them because colonists are firing from behind walls and inside homes. All of this situation is made so much worse when British officers hear the colonists crying out, King Hancock forever. So the colonists had taken this put down by the British officers and made it literally a rallying cry the day the Revolutionary War began. John Hancock had been metaphorically crowned by the colonists. Hancock had been in Lexington that morning just hours before the fighting broke out, and he fled down to Philadelphia for the Second Continental Congress, where he re-engaged with politics in a big way. Something momentous happens for Hancock. The president of the Congress at the time was Peyton Randolph. He'd also served as president of the First Continental Congress. He's from Virginia. He gets called home to his home colony of Virginia to legislate there. Now, this might sound unusual that you would pick your home colony of Virginia over the business of the Second Continental Congress, but this was common throughout the Continental Congress's existence that colony work took precedence over work in the Congress. Congress changes tactics when they look to their, for their next president. They look to the Northern colonies and they, the records of the Second Continental Congress blandly state that you, John Hancock is unanimously selected president. His moderation is what gets him the job. His wealth assuages moderates and conservatives, but he has strong rebel credentials. He'd smuggled Madeira, which fomented a, a mob. And he also had been served as president of the, uh, the Provincial Congress in Massachusetts, which was the first political body to formally reject rule by the British Empire. So he had safe credentials. But this is the problem for his fellow Massachusetts delegates, John Adams and Samuel Adams. Hancock was, oh, look at him. Okay. So this is, uh, we know this as Independence Hall today, but this is the Pennsylvania State House at the time where the Second Continental Congress was held. And we see Hancock with the arrow. As president, he sat in the front of the room with the delegates at the tables in front of him. John, excuse me, John Hancock is not supportive of the Adams Cousins movement for independence in the beginning of 1776. Both John and Samuel were plotting against Hancock and his allies as a result. Thomas Cushing, that moderate who didn't join the Boston Committee of Correspondence, gets pushed out as a delegate and replaced by Elbridge Gerry, a man much more fervently excited about independence. Hancock's too unpopular, uh, excuse me, too popular to unseat, however. But Samuel Adams was growing, according to John Adams, very, quote, very bitter against Hancock for not being inclined towards independence. For his part, Hancock had decades of proof that being a part of the British Empire was financially lucrative. He had traveled to London as a young man to expand his overseas business. He connected with partners there. He even considered marrying a woman in London. Hancock and other affluent men like him 
had many incentives to continue to try to work things out with the British Empire, especially when there was no certainty that independence would protect their significant means. The Adams cousins, in sharp contrast, had far less to lose. Rupturing with Great Britain would cost them little. Eventually, most of the moderates in Congress came around to independence, including Hancock. July 1776 was a turning point for him. Once he went in on independence, he went all in on the Patriot cause. His temperament was still inclined to moderation, which would help the war effort, as we'll talk about, and the new nation, but he could no longer be considered indifferent or wishy-washy to the fight against the crown. Two examples from the 1780s show the impact of Hancock's moderation on the new country's politics. So we're gonna start in the early 1780s. Massachusetts had ratified its constitution in 1780 and Hancock was elected their first governor. The people of Massachusetts were imposed with heavy taxes to pay for the war effort. Those in Western Massachusetts simply couldn't afford this tax burden. So they sent petitions to the legislature, which went nowhere. They organized conventions. Those also amounted to nothing. They thought they were doing the right thing. They thought they were doing, they were using tactics that had been used a decade earlier to effect a break from the British Empire and to make change. But in this case, it wasn't welcome. So many of these men, farmers in Western Massachusetts, and many of them veterans of the recent war, intimidated the courts into closing in 1786. They reasoned that if the courts weren't open, they couldn't charge anyone, um, have their property auctioned off, or be hauled into jail for non-payment of debt. This movement became known as Shays' Rebellion. This is a misnomer because Daniel Shays here, he is a Revolutionary War veteran. He is a poor farmer. He is not the organizer of Shays' Rebellion. He was one of the participants and named the leader by the opposition. Governor James, uh, James Bowden had become governor after Hancock retired, and his legislature passed several harsh and overreaching laws to stop the protests in the West. They suspended civil rights and instituted a riot act in which a sheriff could be exonerated for anyone they killed during a riot. A supporter of Bowdoin, a supporter of Bowdoin, James Warren said this on the severity of the governor's tactics. For fear that Captain Shays should destroy the constitution, they violated it themselves. Bowdoin also wanted to military, su militarily suppress the uprisings in the West. Guess who supports him? The radical Samuel Adams. He finds these men to be traitors and insurgents. And he says that rallying the a militia should uh, head out to the West to put this insurgents down. So the man who whipped up violence in the streets a decade earlier was now condemning it. To suppress the resistance, Bowdoin raised an army of over 4,000 men who marched West to Springfield. Government troops fired on some of the protesters to break ranks. Shortly after, the rebellion in Western Massachusetts petered out. Participants punishments ranged from fees to collection of arms, to suspension of voting rights, which Bowdoin hoped would help in the future elections. It would not, as Bowdoin is going to find out. The worst offenders went on trial and were sentenced to death. The next gubernatorial election saw John Hancock easily voted back into office, winning three quarters of the state's votes. It was the first time in Massachusetts history that an incumbent governor was voted out. After being elected, Hancock, and this is a, a portrait we have of him about this era. Um, this was done between 1785 and 1790, and he's elected back as governor in 1787. He's here with his wife, Dorothy, who was popularly known as Dolly. 
By the way, because I'm in Washington, D.C., I want to mention that this portrait is owned by American University. It's not currently on view, but um, it's here in this city. Hancock, after being elected, Hancock demonstrated how well he understood the people of Massachusetts. He issued full pardons and reinstated the citizenship of the rebellion's participants, except for two men who were accused of breaking into houses. This may have been for self-preservation, as many feared attacks on government officials if participants were executed. Hancock, however, claimed that the pardons were intended to restore the public tranquility, to conciliate the affections of the people, and to establish peace in the state. For most of his life, Hancock had avoided extremes. In 1787, his moderation enormously benefited him, the Western rebels, and the state. He lamented the rebellion, but was optimistic that people would now respect the new government and knew that healing the rift, not widening it, was good for Massachusetts. It also helped that his legislature approved no new taxes that year. <laughs> Hancock and the tax reprieve were the salve the states needed. Even his critics softened a bit. So you all call James Warren had said he was a, a popular supporter of Bowdoin and for years had been a detractor of Hancock's. And while he was disappointed in Bowdoin's reaction to the Shays' Rebellion, he was also disappointed that Hancock was now governor again. But he said, I do not regret the change as much as I once should. Others outside the Commonwealth of Massachusetts were not as charmed. The debt relief in Massachusetts concerned men who saw the masses get what they wanted through protests and elections. A new federal constitution was proposed and Hancock's moderation would again be formative. Given that the constitution still governs the United States today, we can look back on the debate about ratifying the constitution and feel convinced that it was the right government at the right time. Psychologists identify a tendency called hindsight bias wherein people see the results of a past event as predictable or logical. With this thinking, outcomes seemed more likely to have occurred than they actually were, and other perspectives and alternatives are ignored or dismissed as irrelevant to the final outcome. When evaluating history, and especially a revolution, it is easy to succumb to hindsight bias. It's easy to believe that everything transpired the way that it should have or that the outcome was inevitable. But this ignores the complex reality of 1788. The country's proposed government structure, this new federal constitution, was unpopular among many Americans, and there was very real concern that it would not be approved. The constitution was sent to each state to ratify. And the ratification was not done by voting, but by special ratification conventions. The delegates in Massachusetts, those that comprised the Constitutional Convention in Massachusetts, were pretty evenly split, about 50-50 for and against the Constitution. In some ways, the fight over the Constitution mirrored how you felt about Shays' Rebellion a year or two earlier. Those in the West were were reluctant about the Constitution, and those who condemned Hancock for his moderate approach to the rebels were in favor of the Constitution. Before the Massachusetts Convention convened in 1788, four states had already ratified the Constitution. It's also important to know that you didn't need 13 states to ratify this new Constitution, you just needed nine. So four had already ratified, and on the day the Massachusetts Convention was to begin, Connecticut also ratified. So now you are more than halfway to the required states to ratify before Massachusetts has a chance to weigh in. Federalists are the name given to the men who supported the Constitution. And they are excited that half the states have already ratified, but nervous about Massachusetts. 
This political cartoon appears in the Massachusetts Sentinel, and it would be revised as each state approved. So you can see where we are in the approval process. Connecticut has just built one of these five federal pillars. If you can see that this is a Federalist newspaper without knowing anything else, because look where the pillar for Massachusetts is coming. It is coming from the heavens, hoping that Massachusetts too will comprise one of these federal pillars. But Hancock's home state is not simply another state. It is considered a swing state. It had strong revolutionary credentials and clout. And as a result, it was, if it was ratified there, Federalists thought that it would prompt other states to do the same. New Hampshire, its northern neighbor, was waiting to hold their convention until Massachusetts weighed in. Federalists George Washington and James Madison worried that New York could also be swayed by the decision of Massachusetts. Washington acknowledged that it could also sway Virginia. Here's what he says. There is no question, however, but the decision of other states will have great influence here, here that is in Virginia, particularly of one so respectable as Massachusetts. Federalists in Massachusetts knew the stakes were high and they knew who to lobby. The most popular man in Massachusetts and the president of this constitutional convention, John Hancock. Delegate after delegate agreed that whichever side John Hancock landed on would be victorious. For his part, Hancock was wavering between both sides. He mostly feared that a constitution would take away some of his authority as the, as the governor of a sovereign state. So Federalists were caucusing hard after hours. They visited Hancock in his home and made a couple of promises. They proposed a bargain. If he supported the constitution, he could propose changes to it. No state had done this yet. In fact, it was against the rules. You were either supposed to vote for it or against it. But because Massachusetts was so important and Hancock was so important in Massachusetts, they said, you can propose changes. The Federalists knew that if Hancock proposed changes, this might be good enough to bring others into the fold. They also dangled a very enticing prospect in front of him. If he ratified, he may be named president. They said that if Virginia didn't ratify, Maybe it would be Hancock who would become the first president. Everyone agreed that if Virginia ratified, Washington, George Washington would, of course, become the first president. But they said, maybe then you could be number two. So he had the, the promise of being a coming president or vice president in his mind when Hancock decides to support the Constitution. This picture is much earlier in his life. But Hancock wants to make changes. Characteristically, he had chosen a moderate path. He split the difference between support for and opposition to the Constitution. He would vote to ratify, but not in its current form. He proposed nine amendments that focused on the power of the states, which would be stripped by the Constitution as it was currently written. Specifically, Hancock wanted states to have any powers that weren't specifically stated explicitly given to Congress. He also wanted to prevent Congress from directly taxing states until state legislatures had the chance to raise the money themselves. The vote to ratify took place a few days later. It was an intense event. Spectators arrived at nine that morning and they jealously guarded their seats. During a two hour adjournment in the middle of the day, no one moved. One spectator sent a boy to a nearby shop for his midday meal of cheese and gingerbread because he didn't want to give up his seat. Just before the decisive and divisive vote, Hancock made one of the most significant speeches of his life. No matter which side prevailed, he urged, quote, there can be no triumph on one side or chagrin on the other, end quote. If the Anti-Federalists were defeated, they needed to accept that they were defeated and join in with the Federalists. And the Federalists could not gloat or be 
happy that half of the population was unhappy. All delegates, spectators, and citizens should sincerely lament the want of unanimity and strenuously endeavor to cultivate a spirit of conciliation. Throughout the American Revolution, Hancock had excelled at bringing people together. He could generally, genuinely offer such sentiments for unity because he was able to find merits on both sides. I'm going to show you a picture of Elbridge Gary. This is the guy who replaced Thomas Cushing in the Second Continental Congress, Gary being much more um, favoring independence than Cushing. Gary really did not like John Hancock. Throughout their lives, he did not like him. He was a firm detractor of him. He is um, also the person who gives us the name gerrymandering comes from Elbridge Gary. Han Gary frequently um, criticizes Hancock, but listen to what he says um, after Hancock supports the Constitution. He took a fortunate middle course between the violence of opposing factions. This is big praise from Elbridge Gary. <laughs> To soften divisions, Hancock relied on his reputation as a moderate and the social influence he had earned over the past 25 years. We must all rise or fall together, Hancock proclaimed. With that, the vote began and Massachusetts narrowly passed the constitution. And when I say narrowly, I really mean it. It was a, a difference of 5% of the votes, which means that had Hancock come out as that even Hancock's influence had its limit. It did just enough to tick people over to support the Constitution. After Hancock suggested amendments, every other state did the same. Eventually, all of these amendments were rolled up into many amendments, and then 10 were chosen. And these are the Bill of Rights. These were not laws that were originally proposed by the framers. They came from the conventions wanting changes. It's easy to ignore or malign moderates, both in the time in which they lived and in the historical record. This is often because they don't fit into the tidy category required when writing about a revolution or demanded during a revolution. Despite the way the American Revolution is often portrayed, however, the British colonists in North America were not a monolithic body, wholly committed to tearing down a political structure they had known for a century and a half. Look even a little bit under the surface, and moderates were visible everywhere. Hancock was their leader. Thank you. Questions, yes. Uh, thank you for a really outstanding presentation. Um, Brooke, I wondered, um, I've heard, you seem to have heard in the past that Hancock wanted to be the first uh, commanding general of the Continental Army. Is that true? Did you say he wanted to be? Yes, he wanted yes. to be. So this is a good question. And the question is, did he, did John Hancock want to be the general of the commanding, uh, commander in chief of the Continental Army? This depends on whether or not you trust John Adams. Um, and that's a big if. John Adams wrote a lot after, later in his life about these events. And later in his life, he wrote that John Hancock, <laughs> it's this story that's um, kind of funny. I don't believe it to be true, but I'll tell you guys anyway, because it, it gives you a, a view into John, um, John Adams' mindset. He also didn't like Hancock much. Um, when there was discussion about needing a general for the Continental Army. John Adams said that he and his cousin, Samuel Adams, that they stood up and started praising someone that John Hancock thought was him. And John Adams said, you know, because he was president sitting in the front of the room, you saw that picture, that John Adams had this great view of his face. And Hancock looked with excitement as he thought he was about to be named. And then Adams said, his countenance fell, and never did I see a bigger look of mortification when George Washington was named. Okay, that's a funny, sad little story, but 
no, there's no other corroborating evidence. The journals of the Constitutional Convention uh, Congress of the, excuse me, the journals of the Continental Congress simply state that Washington was selected general. Hancock did want military experience. He served as the colonel of the Corps of Cadets in Boston. He went down to Newport, Rhode Island when French naval forces arrived and was really hopeful he'd see battle. But there isn't any evidence that he wanted to be general, aside from John Adams writing much later about it. And by the way, John Adams later said in that same story, he said, John Adams or John Hancock never loved me so well after this. Um, so he's clearly writing years later trying to embarrass Hancock. I, I was just curious as to why John Hancock never progressed in the federal government, uh, president, vice president, member of the cabinet, or he, I don't think he was even a senator. Or no, a he wasn't. Um, when he left the Second Continental Congress, he left the highest position he would ever hold. Being governor of a state at this time was a very high position, but not within the federal government. He, the reason he did, I mean, the reason he doesn't become vice president is something that the the electors would have to, to disclose, but he doesn't get a single vote from Massachusetts. So those promises that were made to him, he he uh, gets sold out and it's, it's not even close. He, I think he gets four votes total. Um, many were concerned, and I write about this in the book, that of his health. He was in poor health for much of his life. But by the 1780s and early 1790s, he, he is unable to walk at times on his own. He's unable to hold a quill. And some people thought he might soon die in the 1780s and that he just didn't have the, the fortitude to serve in such a demanding office. He does die young. He dies in 1793 at the age of 56. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, we're sitting here in the headquarters of the society of the Cincinnati. So I wanted to know uh, what the evolution of John Hancock's thinking was about the society, which, you know, I mean, Henry Knox, who's hanging on this wall, pulled together the troops to suppress Shays' rebellion. General Benjamin Lincoln was commander of that. Yes. And then as soon as Hancock gets into office, he gives amnesty to all of those who and then ultimately proves uh, the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, which sort of guaranteed the right to regress grievances, freedom of the press, uh, not billet officers, which were things that the militias during that rebellion had suppressed. Had, so, so how is all of that connected? What's, what's your understanding of that relationship? So I'm not sure if I can draw a through line for you to connect those ideas, but Hancock with Shays Rebellion, you mentioned Benjamin Lincoln is the one who takes on Shays Rebellion. Bowdoin privately raises this militia. He asks for money from others in Massachusetts because the legislature isn't going to fund this this army to go west. And Hancock notably is not on this list of of people supporting the the violent suppression of it. Um, Hancock's amendments don't go around the ones that you were, um, the, the 10 Bill of Rights. Ultimately, Madison had over a hundred amendments that he kind of had to filter and choose from. And Hancock's biggest concerns were actually around Congress, uh, around states' powers being taken over by Congress and ensuring that anything not explicitly given, no power explicitly given to Congress could then be given to the state. So those were more his concerns about the Constitution. And this makes sense. He's the governor of a sovereign state. At one point, Hancock calls the states separate republics. We think today as, as all of these states being both, sorry, Andrew, as both being American and a member of a state. But at the time, there, that American national consciousness does not, it isn't present in the late 1780s and early 1790s. That doesn't come for some time. And so Hancock is defensive of his rights as the governor of Massachusetts. He finds that to be a high 
national office. Your question about why he never served in the federal government, he had it pretty good as governor of Massachusetts as well. And he was, he got over his suspicions enough, but he, he had concerns about an overreaching central government. How did you choose to write about John Hancock? What made him your subject? Thank you. So John, every American knows the name of John Hancock. I went to the National Archives today uh, where the Declaration of Independence is. And I loved hearing people talk about John Hancock as we were walking in and around the Declaration of Independence. Every American knows his name, but few know how influential and impactful he was in 18th century politics. Um, he's rivaled in popularity really at this time only by George Washington and Benjamin Franklin. That's not precise. There's no, you know, polls taken for popularity at the time, but he's so well known. And I wanted to bring that story forward. He's also a man of contradictions in that he's the wealthiest man in Boston, but he frequently sides with the poor and middling time after time. He looks so visibly above everyone with his clothes and his house and his carriage, and yet he was able to bring people into his fold. And so it was a story I wanted to bring forward. Also, he's politically moderate, and that's important too. When talking about a revolution, identifying that there were people who were figuring it out in the middle, who weren't always all in on, on one side. And so... Um, for all those reasons, I wanted to bring Hancock forward. The full uh, presentation. Um, earlier in the presentation, a mention was made that uh, he signed the Declaration of Independence. I think it should be emphasized that he was the first signer of the Declaration of Independence. Um, now you mentioned he was, his death in 1793. He was actually, he was born in 1737. This is on a personal note on January 12, which happened to be my birthday. And my question is about, did um, the plantation of Jericho play any role in his life? Sorry, can someone, I, I couldn't hear that. Can you just say it a little louder? The last, the last uh, question? Was yes. Yeah, plantation of Jericho. Did it play any role in his, in his life? The plantation uh, of Jericho. Of Jericho. I I'm not familiar. I think he escaped there from the British for a while. But anyway. Sorry. Why did he sign his name so big? Okay, so. Uh, let's look at it. All the way at the beginning here, almost there. Okay, so he signs first and in the center because he's president of the Continental Congress. That's really it. Um, I liken this to sort of a birthday card in an office or family when you're passing it around, you don't know how many people are gonna sign or how big they're gonna sign. On the original, there's plenty of room for people to sign bigger, but they didn't. And so Samuel Adams, ironically, the one who was so gung-ho for independence, has one of the four smallest signatures. And then John Hancock has, has the biggest. Um, but if you look at it, it's not as big as we popularly remember, but it is certainly the most distinguished. Again, there isn't a, really a, a value that we can put on it, but just our eyes tell us that it is... Uh, the best signature. It has what's called a paraff underneath that flourish. This little guy here, that shows gentility and training and practice. There's others who tried to do paraffs and they don't, they're not successful. My favorite is Benjamin Franklin. Um, his paraff is here, it's kind of messy and it's not, um, the, the ink work isn't as clean and consistent. So. He didn't sign as big as we remember, but he signed in the center and the largest simply because he was president. The idea of him signing so big so that King George III could...
That's right. That's not true. Um, that, yeah, that I'll tell you a couple reasons why. So I guess school children still learn this today. I learned this two days ago. Um, but it's not true for a couple of simple reasons. One, there's only one surviving, excuse me, there's only one copy ever of this Declaration of Independence signed by all 56 people, not one surviving copy. There was only ever one, and it was never intended to send to King George III. This, um, <laughs> so it was not, it was not something that the king was ever intending to see. The declaration that people saw until 1818 was the typeset version called the, Bra um, the Dunlap Broadside. If you have seen a printed version of the Declaration of Independence, there's about 20 in circulation. Um, it says at the bottom, printed, John Hancock, president. Literally, it wasn't until 1818 when Americans saw all of these signatures, including Hancock's for the first time. The Declaration of Independence was very battered. It had been nearly destroyed in the War of 1812. And um, they decided to make a copy of it. And that further ruined it, by the way. But it it ensured that we have these signatures. And guess when the myth of the spectacles comes around? Shortly after people start to see this um, beautiful signature. I mean, it's it's really, it's a, it's a beautiful signature. He knew it. This is how he signed um, personal letters too. I mean, it's it's the Olive Branch petition, which was um, signed just a year earlier, has the exact same bold, bigger than everyone else's signature because he was president. So not a true, not true at all. All right, we do have some questions from Zoom, if you'd be. Okay, let's to. zoom in. Um, we have one viewer that would like to know what Hancock was doing in Lexington on the 19th of April. Yeah, that's a great question. So the Provincial Congress I mentioned was that first body, legislative body to formally reject rule, uh, British rule. They were meeting in Concord, Massachusetts, which is where the second battle of the American Revolution, uh, the Revolutionary War happened. And instead of coming back from Concord all the way back to Boston after the Provin Provincial Congress um, concluded their meetings, they just stayed in Lexington. Hancock had a relative there and they were staying in that house. It wasn't safe in April 1775 for Hancock to be in Boston. Um, British soldiers had gone by his office, uh, by, by his home, excuse me, and taunted him saying, this will soon be ours. And so it wasn't safe at that point for Hancock to be in town. So he stayed in Lexington. The reason for Paul Revere's famous midnight ride is to warn Hancock and Samuel Adams, who was also in Lexington at the time, that they were in danger. So they, so Revere and others thought. Great. Thank you. Um, and another viewer would like to know, um, following the, well, between the Boston Massacre and uh, the Battle of Bunker Breeds Hill, um, what was the, re the personal relationship between Dr. Joseph Warren and John Hancock? Yeah, it seemed we don't have much uh, um, correspondence between them. They were mostly in the same city at the time, but they were both Masons, we know, um, and friendly. When... Warren dies. It's so, this is so sad. Um, Warren dies in the Battle of Bunker Hill, and Hancock writes him a letter the next day, not knowing that he had just died. And he says, General Washington's coming up. Please make arrangements for him. You're going to like him. And then he says, as he does with everyone, please write back to me. I need news from Boston. How are you? your sincere friend. I mean, it's really was devastating to read that, knowing that not only would Warren never get that letter, but that when Hancock found out the news, how how sad that would be for him. Great, thank you. And uh, we do have several questions. Um, not only are people interested in your book, they're also interested in your the old tavern tours, <laughs> yes. uh, because nothing says history like good beer, right? Yes, exactly. Um, so uh, could you tell us a little bit about that? Happy to. 
We have someone here who's been on our tours who can attest how fun they are. <laughs> Um, yes. <laughs> so they, um, we visit 10 historic sites in Boston. We stop at three taverns for a beer or cider. It's really fun and informative. We talk about the role of alcohol in the American revolution and it's a great two hours. So, um, yield tavern tours, come see us when you're in Boston. They're a lot of fun and, right. and you learn a lot. Perfect. All right. So if any of you are in Boston, go see her. Um, and uh, we do have copies of uh, her book on the back table. So purchase a book on your way out. Uh, Dr. Barbier, I want to thank you very much. I think we're, we'll wrap it up there for being here and talking with us tonight for all of you for coming out in person and for those of you tuning in at home on Zoom or wherever you are. So uh, thank you very much for your continued support of our mission and we will see you next time. Get home safe. Thanks, Boom. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys.